Hello and welcome to the final lecture of the lecture series on feminist political theory and discourse by the Political Theory Student Research Committee of IAPS. Um, this lecture is recorded, so by attending this lecture, you are going to have in your voice and potentially picture and video recorded. This recording will be later on uploaded to the IAPS YouTube channel. The final speaker for the lecture series is Kat Belasti. She is an incoming LSC uh, Master of Science graduate in International Migration and Public Policy. Kat, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erin, um, and welcome everybody to this um, lecture series. Today, we're going to talk about um, a very interesting and important topic that is decolonial feminism and intersectionality with um, an approach to the Ecuador's feminist movement. So um, first of all, um, we have the abstract of this um, presentation. So um, this research aims to discuss the relevance between um, colonialism and the remnants of the social hierarchy within gender expressions, which are related uh, reflections by feminist movements located specifically in the global South. And with the objective of falsifying the presented hypothesis, um, the methodology that um, this research used was um, hermeneutical interpretative approach, which uh, positions diverse women's testimonies and um, experiences as rich categories of knowledge production. So this presentation constitutes three important sections. First of all, the Ecuador's feminist movement contextualization. Second, um, we have contributions to analyze decolonial feminism as well as intersectionality. And finally, um, a critical discussions of the feminist movement's narratives in Ecuador in order for women and dissidences to reflect and enunciate themselves from the diversity of otherness in the global South. And the key words of this presentation would be coloniality and decoloniality, decolonial feminism, intersectionality, feminism, and finally, power structures. So to begin, uh, the introduction of this presentation is that um, women who inhabit the global south, this geographical space that has been traced by imaginary lines, um, in contrast to the rest of the women in the world, share in a specific and collective experience. And this experience is called the coloniality of power. To understand a little bit more of what coloniality of power is, this term refers to a power pattern that operates through the naturalization of racial and social hierarchies that allow the reproduction of epistemic domination. So this is uh, an experience that no other woman in the world lives unless they are located in this imaginary space called the global south. Then we have um, the most relevant or some of the most relevant decolonial thought theorists. Um, in first place, we have Aníbal Quijano, which is a Peruvian political theorist and sociologist. And he is most famous uh, for talking about the theory of decoloniality, decoloniality of power, which is the theory that um, revolved around this presentation. Then we have Enrique Dosso. He was an academic philosopher and theologist, and he talked about the, the theology of liberation with a Latin American perspective. And finally, we have Catherine Walsh. She is an academic professor and feminist activist here in Ecuador, and she studies decoloniality and intercultural studies. So then we have um, decolonial feminist academics. So there is a group of academic feminists that study the characteristics of global South women. And to provide a critical approach to this hegemonic and homogeneous idea of what being woman represents. So uh, being a woman is to be very diverse, to enunciate from different places and to have different perspective of life and also race and class um, play a really big role in how we enunciate yourself. 
So we have, for example, uh, Maria Lugones, which is an academic feminist, Chandra Mohanty, Yuderkis Espinosa Miñoso, who is a really important and relevant um, feminist and activist from Central America. And she has um, talked about decoloniality as a way to enunciate from and separate from this white and more liberal feminist feminism who tends to erase women of color and their petitions and necessities. Then we have Oji Curiel and finally uh, Rita Segato, who is a sociologist and anthropologist uh, feminist from Argentina. So as a first exponent of the term intersectionality, we have um, Rolly Crenshaw, who is a very um, famous and relevant American researcher and feminist who specialized in topics such as critical theory of race and gender. And among her most relevant contributions, we have that she used the term intersectionality for the first time in her work. So then we have um, the contextualization of the problem. And now we specific we have a specific, the Ecuadorian case. So um, this is a little bit of an approach of how the feminist movement uh, appeared and then grew within the years in Ecuador. So in the 80s decade, the Ecuadorian feminist movement was created. However, it is very important to state that um, indigenous women in Ecuador already had a feminist thought in their communities and in their actions of being um, representatives or of their people, of their communities and taking decisions and um, making uh, protests and being activists. However, um, I had stated over here that in the 80s decade, the Ecuador feminist movement was created because it was um, a bit more institution institutionalized, um, like brought to the institutions by um, predominantly white uh, feminists. And this, this happened because Ecuador is a very racist country. And in this time, uh, it was more racist. Um, so the women that were considered feminism, feminists, sorry, had to be white. Um, so that it is a bit of a little bit of context of that decade, and then uh, forward to the nineties decade, um, there were uh, international agreements regarding women's rights that were ratified by the Ecuadorian state, um, as well as national laws such as the free maternity law that was um, passed in nineteen ninety eight the political participation law regarding uh, women and other national laws. Uh, additionally, the women, women's organizations, feminist organizations started uh, to have more relevance in this decade. So they started to put an agenda, a feminist agenda in the Ecuadorian uh, state. And then in the further years, debates and reflections regarding um, the gender movements in the country uh, and also institu institutionalized feminism was specialized. So in the further years, Ecuador had a little bit of a um, spin of what the feminist movement was um, already portrayed. So more debates and more uh, problematics were, were brought into discussion. Um, okay, so then uh, passing into something that is really important, uh, a really important contribution is that um, decolonial feminists in Ecuador doesn't really have a um, predominant um, space, to put it in some word, here in the country. Why? This because um, most of the feminist organizations here in Ecuador try to uh, have an approach to feminism in one side from a liberal approach. So there are a lot of feminist organizations that work really close with government 
really close with authorities to um, maybe put in the agenda other types of topics such as political participation, such as non-discrimination to women that are um, occupying a place of power within the government. However, the critic that has been made to this type of feminism here in Ecuador to these days is that that type of feminism uh, tends to look over or to erase um, feminists who have uh, race and class struggles between them. So for example, um, here uh, in Ecuador, or like Ecuador is a very diverse country that has a lot of black communities and indigenous communities that um, are the most of the population in Ecuador. So uh, the more uh, white women and white sectors of, of the population tend to erase and to discriminate black and indigenous women and they don't really struggle for their necessities and the diverse necessities of the women in Ecuador. That is why um, decolonial feminism um, is a critic of the excluent feminism and comes off as the voice of women who has been who have been historically uh, silenced and uh, discriminated by things not only like gender, but also, as I mentioned, class, race, ethnicity, geopolitics, sexuality, and among other discriminations. And this is why decolonial feminism is so important because it proposes to um, maybe uh, erase or critique the category of these white and bourgeoisie and also Eurocentric um, that comes from the global north um, that states that this feminism of empowerment or this liberal feminism of being our own bosses and um, maybe being in, in control of the same things that now men are disputing the control obviously without consideration, considering that um, women who are subordinated and women that aren't in the same uh, class and race hierarchy that may be white women. Um, and in the other side, in the intersectional perspective that has uh, situated as a maybe more modern critique to reflect that the, the subject or the main character of feminism has been uh, revised and has been studied by decolonial feminism. This, um, it, in this point, is important to state that intersectionality refers specifically to the crossing of different types of discrimination. So that is a very important um, contribution that feminists such as Kimberly Crenshaw and other um, Black feminists had, had put on the agenda. And that it that um, women are not only discriminated by their um, condition of gender, but also discriminated by other types of struggles, as I mentioned before. Um, so to, to interconnect and intertwine these uh, discriminations gives us a more integral and a more diverse way of studying and looking to the feminist movement. So we as women have or face more discriminations at the same time. So that changes the context and that um, gives us another perspective of the feminist struggle. That is why the decolonial feminism comes into action and it is proposed 
by specifically this woman who always felt sterkly discriminated and sterkly um, set aside by other types of feminists. And um, in another hand, it is also important to mention that feminist is not homogeneous. Feminist is not uh, just a single type of viewing the gender struggles that we face as women and dissidences. But feminist it is uh, diverse. It is heterogeneous. Uh, it is not, we are not able to study feminism uh, in only one way and we are not able to view it as our own individual uh, discriminations that we face, but we also have to know that there are women and dissidences that don't have the same privileges as other women and are faced and struggle other types of discrimination. So um, decolonial feminism here in Ecuador specifically, uh, is this counter hegemonic um, perspective of feminism that has been integrated to the theoretical process and also epistemic process of feminist investigation. This because it um, expands the, the knowledge and the thoughts respect uh, regarding the, how the uh, power relations operate in societies such as the Ecuadorian society, which is um, a very um, racist and discriminate, discriminatory uh, society, which where we have a very small geographical space, but, but a very big diversity of women and many um, intertwined discriminations. Um, so in that sense, intersectionality and decolonial feminism uh, has uh, or tend to extend the arc of possibility to think about the critic and the feminist practice here in the country. Um, additionally, decolonial feminist here, feminism here in Ecuador has taken, uh, has taken place more in the in this decade and um a lot of indigenous and black women have constituted their um organizations their feminist organizations in contrast to the hegemonic feminism that had been taking place here in the country that was has as i stated before specifically um leadered by white women. So that is really um, revolutionary enough because, um, as I said, indigenous and black women already had the a feminist thought even before feminism as a movement was constituted and created here in the country. So seeing that nowadays black and indigenous women have uh, or are leading their own um, feminist movements and are putting a new agenda in the feminist struggle is not only necessary and not only historically um, reivindicatory, but also revolutionary. Because in this um, Ecuadorian society that is always um, discriminating women because of where they come from, and their class um, and race levels or hierarchy, it is very important and very necessary that um, these communities of women who have been historically discriminated and set aside now take place and now leader um, this type of movements and organizations that are um, now growing day by day here in Ecuador. So um, that is very important to state and to notice. Um, and to wrap up this presentation, um, I wanted to mention three really important topics, sorry, um, that um, 
I have taken from this decolonial feminism and intersectionality, intersectionality sorry, studies and this new perspective that has opened my eyes because before studying this topic, I wasn't really very aware of what um, this um, signified and like the symbolic contribution and also in the practice of feminism activism that had um, the decolonial feminism. So first of all, um, it is important to state that intersectionality um, has also been questioned, questioned by decolonial feminism. They don't all only exist and intertwine together, but there ha has also uh, been um, critiques from um, decolonial feminism to the term intersectionality. This has been, however, in a good way, taken into consideration that this critique has come from the perspective of thinking um, further of the intersectional analysis and um, taking into consideration the power relations and power structures that conform our social reality and social approaches. And then in second place, the uh, intertwine of the coloniality of gender um, who has have to um, who have to um, maybe uh, erase who has to erase or to has that has to been has to be questioned um, in order for women who, to emancipate from this hegemonic structure and this um, uh, oppressive structure. Um, evidences um, grades of oppression in more quantity and profundity of the intersectional purpose or the or the internet intersectional thought. And um, at the end, um, I wanted to state that decolonial feminism not only intertwines and includes intersectionality as a as a tool and as a political practice, but also it introduced uh, contributions to the concept in order to uh, walk towards a more uh, heterogeneous, uh, inclusive and enriched uh, feminist struggle within diversity. So as I said before, um, the, the principle or the most relevant um, approach and contribution that femini decolonial feminist leaves us is that it aims to look at the feminist struggle from an inclusive and diverse perspective. I think that'd be everything. Erin, um, if you have some instructions, that'd be great.
I don't know if anyone has any questions regarding the presentation. And um, as I knew, we have oh, about sorry, 10 minutes. I'm sorry, sorry. I, I think I was somehow still muted. <laughs> so that is, that is my bad. Apologies, oh, everyone, for that. Not embarrassing at all. Um, yes, uh, if if anyone has uh, has questions about the presentation now, you can either unmute yourselves and uh, and ask your question, or you could type in the in the chat. Um, so I could I could start. I I did ask my my question very very nicely and eloquently while I was muted. Um, so I would like, I found what you said about indigenous women already having a feminist movement before the 80s uh, quite, quite interesting. Um, whether we could actually classify that as a feminist movement or as a, as a way of, of living in indigenous communities in Ecuador, I am not qualified to speak on that. Um, so I, I was wondering if you can give some more information about indigenous feminist movements today. In, in Ecuador? Yes, of course. Um, so um, first of all, as I said before, before the 80s, there already was a practic practice or practical way of living in the indigenous communities um, that yeah, were, weren't classified yet as feminism, but didn't fall in, into the feminist category. However, um, there were important leaders, women leaders, such as, for example, Transit Tamawanya, who was a indigenous woman that um, was in the front of a lot of struggles, not only feminist struggles, but also emancipation and indigenous liberation struggles. Um, so in, in that, um, state or in that um, line of thought in the further years and also now in the, the actual years, um, there have been a lot of indigenous organizations, uh, feminist organizations that have um, taken place in, in these struggles and in the protests that we have here in the country. And one of them, for example, um, are indigenous uh, feminist organizations that come from the Amazon. So uh, in the Amazon, there is a group of uh, feminist women that um, not only struggle for their gender oppressions, but also struggle for their um, nat natural resources and the oppression that they live as communities and as women from Amazon communities that um, are being uh, put in danger by the extractivist um, groups that come here to Ecuador that are multinationals that uh, extract um, oil from our ground and that principally contaminate uh, our rivers. So there is a group of women in the Amazon basin that struggle for their um, systemic and gender oppressions, but also for these new type of oppressions that have been, um, that they have been facing in the modern um, days. So I think that that is very um, important to mention and also, um, it maybe broadens our per perspective to see that indeed, um, for example, indigenous women in the Amazon do face other type of discriminations and oppressions that, for example, um, a woman that lives in the city or in the more urban space and that, I don't know, has access to, to university or to academy, um, we do face um, obviously gender oppressions, but it is very different and distant to, for example, these communities and these um, organizations of feminist women that inhabit the Amazon basin here in Ecuador. Thank you for your answer. Um, 
do we do you have any any other questions by by someone else because I could I could ask more but let's see if someone else would like to ask anything I will be taking that as a no so I will ask the final question for for this presentation um do you do you have any information on perhaps cooperation or synergies between indigenous feminist movements and non-indigenous ones, uh, whether that is on, on intersectional approaches or in, I don't know, day-to-day -day mainstream uh, gender microaggressions, like cooperation in general, is, is that a thing? Or is, is a feminist movement fragmented and alienated from one community to the other? Um, okay, um, that is um, a really good question and it really depends on the type of feminist, um, of indigenous feminist organization, because um, in a broader sense, there is a connection and maybe uh, the feminist um, indigenous organizations and maybe the more urban feminist organizations are intertwined, they do um, work together. However, it really depends on, as I said, the indigenous organizations, because there are some that are open to work with um, more like urban feminist organizations, but there are others that are a bit more fragmented and um, what they say um, to, the argument that they use for their actions and their fragmentation is that the feminist movement in the city doesn't um, tackle or doesn't seem to um, maybe like um, put in the agenda their own struggles and their own um, specific and different discrimination from, as I said, a woman from the city. So it really does does depend on the type of organizations because we have a lot, a lot of organizations um, from feminism uh, here in, country, in the country, um, taking into consideration that there is a lot of diversity of race and ethnicity in Ecuador. So in that sense, we have a lot of feminist organizations that struggle for different necessities and that have different agendas. Um, but however, um, there is a national feminist coalition in Ecuador that um, aims to bring together uh, as many as, as feminist organization as it can. Um, and that is a really good way to work together without um, putting some necessities or interests uh, higher than others, but it has a more horizontal and um, inclusive and maybe also equitative way of seeing the feminist struggle here in the country. So um, I think that is a really good um, alternative that we have this coalition exists maybe um, since 2019 or 2018, that, which it states that is really um, new. However, it has ha had um, a, a lot of, uh, it has been brought a lot of results and it has, um, um, it has um, maybe organized a lot of struggles and has um, approached a lot of new laws within this coalition. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. It is, it was, it, it's indeed a, a topic that, that requires more, uh, more attention. Do we have any, any final questions? Anything by anyone? I will be taking that as a no. Uh, Kat, thank you so much for, for all your research and your presentation. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you everyone else for, for joining us today for, for this lecture.
yes, thank you. And thank you all for showing up and being here for this very um, important, but also a bit difficult topic, which requires a lot more, more of research in the next years. <laughs>